Finally, he's wiping his tears. He says, there's a suicidal spirit in this room. He's wiping his tears. He says, he just says that. And it was just total silence. And everybody realized, you know, you're crying because you feel like a sense that there's somebody here who wants to take their life. And I was like, oh, you know, like. And that was you. Yes, it was me. And he's just wiping his tears and he says, please come up here and let us pray for you, whoever you are. God has a plan for your life. He doesn't want you to die tonight. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. Oh, John, what an impactful um, half hour we had last time with Lacey Sturm, who talked about where she was at as a little poor girl who had no daddy, was moving from house to house with her mom in a bad situation, ended up with her grandmother who took her to that church because she was desperate trying to figure out what Lacey needed to get her life back on track. She was hanging out with the wrong crowd, doing the wrong things. I'm sure there are desperate moms and dads. It's maybe you who has that little girl who's doing the same thing or that uh, young boy who's doing the same thing. This program is for you and for that young person who feels despair, may not feel loved. We're gonna talk about those deep, heart issues today, which makes me proud to be here at Focus on the Family. Mm -hmm. uh, Lacey, let me simply welcome you back to the program. Thank you. I mean, I'm already in tears, and that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love your spirit and your desire to reach those people that don't know the Lord, mm -hmm. and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, last time we did talk about your suicidal thoughts and where you're at. And, and I mentioned there's so much suicide today in uh, particularly the teenager's world, yeah. high schools, et cetera, people that are bullied. Um, it just seems to be that uh, decision that's being made, as my wife said, and my wife lost her brother to suicide many years ago. And she said, unfortunately, young people are f trying to find a permanent solution, suicide to a temporary problem, yeah. whether it's not being accepted or not feeling loved. As life continues, hopefully those pains and those things become more manageable emotionally. But teenagers aren't always equipped to manage that trauma, and they end up making the ultimate poor, permanent decision of taking their own life. You mentioned in your book the reason, um, having courage to live, and I, I'll point that the point out, and I want you to elaborate on it, but one, you said it's brave to keep living when life is sad or difficult. Now, you know, working with people who are sad and in despair, that's a hard thing to convince them of. Mm -hmm. um, what are you getting at when you say, hey, it's important to live even if you're feeling sad? Well, what I understood when I, when I encountered God was that he is he is very, he is very real. He is very, he's holy. He's holy. And he's, his love is so, um, is so overwhelming, so overpowering, so all consuming that the questions and the weight and everything, it, it, it's like turning the light on so bright that all the shadows disappear. And you can't, and, and I don't sit and I say, well, bad things happen because of this. No, I say my cousin was murdered, beaten to death by a stepfather, and then I encountered God. And I have no reasons for the other, but I know that there's a good God who's holy. And I can't tell you any answers that are tangible, but I can say when you encounter God that you will have that light that's so bright, that's mm -hmm. so beyond me. Like, it's so beyond me. His love is so beyond my understanding, and it's so tangible. Uh, Lacey, I was going to say, the question might pop into people's mind who are struggling, who have that bitterness because something uh, bad happened in their life. It may not have been the death of a cousin, but maybe the death of a child mm -hmm. or the death of a spouse. Um, how do you make that change? Mm -hmm. How does that change happen where you can go from you, in your case, it moved you toward not believing in God, seeing your cousin die at the hands of his stepfather. Mm -hmm. 
how does a person let go? How do they say, okay, Lord, I'm going to accept the fact that bad things happen and that it's not your fault? Well, we, we make this outside of in knowing God and like not just, not just knowing about God, but knowing him. Outside of that, we make this life about this life. And this isn't all there is. This is, this is a shadow of what's to come. We're eternal beings, and our and to recognize, if you were in heaven, looking at the earth, seeing these things happen, and God were to say to you, "Can I send you? Will you help? What will you do? Huh. Can you go be a light?" You know, from that perspective up there, where you in eternity, can you? Will you go step into time? Huh. It's like this question of like. We get a chance right now. Life is a gift to you. And no matter what happens, whether somebody lives or dies, you're breathing and you have a purpose. God doesn't give you the miracle of life on accident. It's purposeful. It's intentional. I realized when I woke up the next day and I didn't commit suicide. I think about this sometimes. When I tell my story, I get nervous because I know some people out there have people in their lives that have committed suicide. And they're asking, why didn't God do that for them? You know? And so I'm thinking... You know, when I wake up the next day, after I didn't end my life, I realize I wasn't supposed to wake up today. Mm. That flicker of hope that I had when I said, yes, you can pray for me, that small little choice, it's, and him coming in, me being willing. He will not cross our willingness. It was not my grandma's fault that I was suicidal. I want to say that to people who've had loved ones commit suicide that feel guilty because they said something. There, is, there was an ulterior, I was looking for an excuse, and I would have found it. Whether it was her, or it was something else. Her intention was not to do that. Even if it had been, I would have found it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to speak to people who might feel guilty, because their relationship be, about their life is between them and God. Yeah. And, that, and that's what I had to understand when I woke up the next day. I wasn't supposed to wake up today. Yeah. Why do you care? Why do you love me? And here I am. And why did you give me more time? Because yeah. I don't have any plans. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love the way you, you depicted that and described it because God doesn't overstep the boundary of our own will. Right. That's what's so amazing. Yeah. Yet he does have a plan for us. The question is, are we willing? Yeah. Are we willing to say, yes, okay, I'll wake up today and yeah. I will live for you. Yeah. And that's huge. Yeah. I mean, that is critical. But, um, you know, so often we're distracted, Lord. Can you come back tomorrow? Because I got things to do today. <laughs> and, and that's what I love about what you have done now with your vocation. Um, a lot of Christians may question you as to why you would continue in rock music. And I want to get to that. Um, well, I have a question for a lot of Christians about why they would not <laughs> no, go it's into fair. rock music. Well, let's talk no, about just... it. How God has perked your, or, you know, pricked your heart to yeah. say, okay. Go meet with people that are not speaking Christianese. Go yeah. engage your life, pour your life out for people that don't act the way that your Christian friends act. Yeah. Um, it's easy to rationalize to pull out of that. Now mm-hmm. that you're saved and you're clean, you're not going to put yourself in that environment. And I'm sure some people listening are saying, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. How could you put yourself in that spot yeah. to be in the world, especially given what God has done to save your life? But music was a passion for you. You had the ability, and you've chosen to stay engaged in music. Speak to this Mm -hmm. uh, idea of you as a believer in Jesus going into the darkness Mm -hmm. to be a light. Well, um, I think the the way that it happened, really, I just felt like when I sat down the next day at my school, I sat down in the cafeteria, after I woke up going, I wasn't supposed to wake up today. Why do you care? Why do you love me? His love just flooded me in that moment. And I knew that um, he has purpose. I don't know what it is, but he loves me. Mm-hmm. I walked to school. I start to see the birds and the trees. And I'm like, this is intentional. It's not an accident. His lo- love is everywhere. And I sit down. And I'm when I became a fan of a band or a fan of an artist, I look at all their work. I look at all their lyrics. I, I be, you know. I start to want to know who they are, and I, because in the art, there's the fingerprints of the artist. You know, you get to learn about them through their artwork, and so I'm, so, so I'm looking at nature as I walk to school that morning, 
and I noticed this is God's art. It, there's story, there's his, his, something of him is in all of this. And then I get to school, sit in the cafeteria, look around at all these people I hated the day before. And I realized the Lord starts to press on my heart. This is my masterpieces. These are my works of art. And so I was like, just blown away, like began to cry. I'm like, if, with God's love for each person he made, no matter, and I'm looking at the kids in special ed sitting over here and the kids and the and the preppy kids over here and all of those, the kids nobody notices, the nerdy kids over here, and I'm looking at all these people and I just have judged. And here God's like, each one I created, I give each one life. And and I was just blown away. And I thought, I need, I want to know them. Because they say something about who God is. No matter what they're going through, no matter what choices they're making, they're, if they're breathing, there is some glory in them, you yeah. know? And so it made me love people. Yeah. Well, and, and in this context, I mean, a lot of Christians, again, will say, I mean, you go play music in concert halls and probably in bars and other things. What are the people like that you encounter there as you're mm-hmm. singing your songs and being a, <laughs> a light? And describe uh, a memory of being in front of people performing but talking about the Lord to these people that are going, what? What is she saying? So I um, I got to write a song for a vampire movie. <laughs> um, and I did that after I left Flyleaf. Um, Flyleaf was your original band? Flyleaf was the original band I was in for 10 years. And we toured all over with bands who totally you know crazy i loved that music because it was it felt honest to me yeah. it felt like more honest than other music well in fact just as a sidebar here you said in your book that you were screaming in your music because that's what was in your heart and for parents who don't understand that rage uh, that was an eye-opener for me when i read that mm. that that in that artistic form of what we would say that's music you know we'd be <laughs> critical of that but you were letting that emotion out that nobody understands me all i have inside of me is pain Mm -hmm. and you're screaming while playing music is that a fair description well yeah i mean i remember after i became a christian looking for that in a christian bookstore and wondering why people don't have music like that in a christian bookstore because i'm like jesus died on a cross you know he screamed out in pain like why would there not be some like really heavy music here like there's some crazy things people were martyred for their faith why wouldn't we scream about these things like i couldn't find it and i was confused you know it's it's hard to believe a soft-spoken person like you would actually (laughs) scream but i guess it's true well you know i think it's it's whenever you have a passion for like i want to scream over the injustice of suicide i know what it feels like I want to scream over the pain somebody feels from somebody being murdered in their life or somebody just feeling like they are worthless and uh. and it's not true and they know they've been abused. And, um, mm. you know, I want to scream with them. I want to say, yeah, you know, God weeps with you. He's angry over injustice, you know. And that's a good thing to know because people always talk about God being this all-loving God, but he has to be angry about evil. So you ended up doing this song for this uh, movie, mm-hmm. but talk about how God has used that. I I got asked to do the song after I left Flyleaf, and um, I had been burdened in, the, in my heart about leaving Flyleaf, and I had thousands of emails from kids who were asking me about feeling suicidal, feeling depressed, feeling, how, what do I do about not believing in God, but they want to, and they don't know where to turn, and they've seen all this, you know, all these things that, and my heart was heavy to reach people who would never go to church, who would never hear, you know, um, the gospel, and, and I was like, I'm walking away from my platform in the mainstream, because as an, with an evangelist heart, you know, you want to keep your You want to keep your audience so that their ear, you know, however you can. And I was just crying out to God. I'm like, God, send someone, send someone out there. If you're calling me home, send someone out there. And then I got this phone call and they were asking me about doing this vampire movie. And I thought, oh gosh, you're going to let me have a voice in that environment. You know, what, how can I, how can I bring you there? You know, where those, those kids are the ones, Mm -hmm. the ones who aren't going to go to church when they're going to go see this movie. How can I bring your voice there? And uh, and so I looked up the synopsis of the movie, 
and um, realize there's this whole theme about um, these powerful creatures. And and I realized, you know, God made us to be powerful creatures. Right. And it reminded me of the gospel, so I was able to write this song. And I said, well, Jesus, well, God said, I'm just going to become a man and show them what it means to be human, what it means to be a child of God. And I'm going to, in a, in G, and I say, and Jesus was powerful and beautiful, and he was brave, and he was courageous, and he was kind and merciful, and he was miraculous. And I was like, this is who God calls his children to be. And this is in your concert. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that's who you are. And I can just feel them like, really? <laughs> like, that's who I am? Every person he created to be his children. And he said, if they will just, and I say, you know, so he came to earth so he could show us who to be. I'm going to, yeah, they deserve to die for all this hatred and sin. So I'm just going to die in their place. So he's hanging naked, bleeding, murdered by his own creation on the cross. And they're spitting on him and mocking him. And the enemy saying, they're not going to believe even if you die. They're not going to believe even if you pay for this. They're going to keep choosing that darkness. And he's saying, so the chorus of the chorus says, I won't repent from this. Blood is binding. And and I got it from the verse that says, God's gifts and call are without repentance. Mm. And so he's saying on the cross, this is what I tell them. He's saying, I'm not going to repent from this, even though they're mocking and spitting. I'm not going to repent from this. He went through the, he, had, he took this in, he went through the crucifixion, and then he went and he died and he he took the keys from the devil. He, he busted out of hell. Nobody has to go there. He raises from the dead and says, you are made to live forever. And if you just trust me, Put your hope in me and believe it, then you can have it. Wow. And I say that, and the audience is like, and, and you know, at your secular concert. Yeah, and then you can tell who the Christians are because they're already, you know, <laughs> but the non Christians, you can tell them they're just a light comes on and they're like, whoa, yeah, that's a good story. It's good mm, news. It's the good news. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's interesting to see the response and the bar all the people at the bar turning and just silence, even the bartender. It's amazing to watch it in the middle of these shows and and just feel God's presence come. And I just know he's speaking what only he can do yeah. in their hearts. Do you resonate with that uh, scripture where it talks about they hated him? You know, they, they despised Jesus because he was a friend of sinners. <laughs> I mean, does that connect with you? Well, I feel like I've experienced that for sure. And I'm thankful to have to say that because you have to yeah to, to know that you're really following so. let me ask you this question with the power of media in our culture i mean whether it's movies or music or video games or all the things that many of us as christian parents are concerned about because our kids are being pulled and drawn into that um what's a perspective that we should have as christian adults to say okay this is the world we live in mm -hmm. how do we go about uh, embracing not the sin of it, yeah. but but embracing God's presence in it all, yeah. and teaching our children um, to be able to be a Christ follower, mm -hmm. even though they're bombarded mm -hmm. with um, messages that are so worldly. Yeah. I mean, you're living in both camps. You have one yeah. foot in your Christian world and one foot in your rock and roll world. Yeah. How do you manage that? Well, I have really, I have really black and white conversations with my five-year-old. He asks really good questions. Huh. And I don't think I've ever not told him. I, I don't think, and I think the, that the grace of God has been on me to be able to explain to him some things. Um, and he's seen a lot, you know, like one time he was having a, a fit and he, and it was at a club. And when we went into that city, sometimes you enter a city and you can feel what's going on in there. I have this discernment gift and so does he it's an empathy gift and um he has the same thing i know he had he's had it since he was little i can be smiling at him hand him his breakfast and him say mom why are you sad and i'm like how do you know that he just knows <laughs> and so my son so when i walked when we went into the city we felt i felt a the suicide and depression and as soon as we pulled into the club it was like like a really heavy i looked out the window and there was Tons of fans that were waiting outside the um, and uh, the bar and the band we we're playing with was just very dark, and you can tell they're struggling, oh, self harm, suicide, depression, and my son, 
Um, he's only five. He starts having this crazy fit, and he says, starts saying terrible things about him, like I about himself, like I'm. I'm always bad. I always get in trouble. I never do anything good. I don't want to live. I don't want to <sighs> live. I don't want to live. Like he's saying. And I'm like, first thing I think is, why are we here? I get to bring my kids home. Why don't, like, I can't put my kids in this environment. And I feel the Lord's peace come over me. And he's like, I brought you here. Remember? You don't think I give you, I give good gifts to my children. And, he, and he's like, tell him who he is. And I, so I was able to stop and he listened so clearly. And, you know, it's important to know where you're called. If you're not called there, I don't think you'd have the grace to do that. But God was so faithful to meet me. And so I'm sitting in his little bunk and I'm telling him, Joshua Lewis, you, you, he loves Jesus. He talks about Jesus all the time. I was like, you love Jesus and you have his spirit in you. You know, he asked. One time he told me, my soul is broken. <laughs> and I said, because he's crying. And I, and I was like, well, you can ask the Holy Spirit to come in your heart and fill your, and fix your soul. And he said, the Holy Spirit, come in my heart and fix my soul. Oh, <laughs> you know, he say that. But we're sitting in the bunk, and I said, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And you know God knows every person. And he knows those people that are outside here. He said, I, I said, ask him, why, do you, why are we here today? Why are we here? And he's wiping tears. Because you want to tell people about Jesus. You're going to rock out and tell people about Jesus. I said, yes. And he said, and he, and he said, um, and you're going to tell the girls because we talk about the girls a lot. Yeah. And, um, That's and I good. said, yes. And, and I said, and God knows every single person's heart and what they're dealing with. And there are people here tonight that don't love themselves. They don't want to live and they hurt themselves. And what you're feeling, these are not your feelings. You're feeling what they're feeling. And so you need to understand. And he and I said, if God gives you his Holy Spirit to show you what someone else is feeling, then you need to be know that God's calling you to pray for them. Yeah. And he said, I want to pray for them now. Yeah. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Because what that a great doesn't, teaching lesson. Yeah, I because mean, so he goes, so he just says, God, I pray that you would. And he, he let them know you love them, God, and let them know that <laughs> you made them and that they have that you. And he was just so beautiful. I'm crying, you know. And so I. I think the first thing is knowing where you're called, knowing that this is what you're meant to do so the grace of God is with you and covering you, and then being brave to trust him to stand firm in that calling when the enemy tests, Comes after you. tests it and says, well, because I don't know what my son's called to do in his future, but I know it's great because I told the Lord, I don't want to have boys unless they're going to be great. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And you're beautifully setting up the next point, which is service toward others. And that's the answer of, you know, having that courage to live. And in your book, you talk about have a mindset, have a desire to serve others. And you have done such a beautiful job, Lacey, living your life, even with all of your pain. Um, that you have been able through the help of God, obviously, to transform that into an attitude of serving others, people that a lot of Christians would turn away from. Mm. You're right in the middle, and I so respect that. Mm. And um, in my own way, want to do that, whether it's with the abortion people or gay activists. You know what? God died for them too. Yes. And we as Christians have to stop turning our back on them because yeah. God is saying, Tell them about me. Yeah. And when you do it, do it with a heart of love and compassion. Yes. Not judgment. Yes. And when we do that, it's amazing how the heart of people, like at your concerts, they will open up yeah. to God because of how you have set the table. Yeah. And so often we're destroying the table. They have to know yes. that you love them before you can correct anything. Well, I admire your courage and <laughs> what you have done. And in your book, the Reason by Lacey Sturm, to be able to articulate um, the pain that you've had, those desperate times of suicidal thoughts, God reaching down and saying, no, no, you're mine, mm -hmm. through that pastor, yes. wiping those tears away, and then setting you on a path to engage a dying culture that doesn't know him. I love it. Mm -hmm. And if I were your daddy, I would just say, you go, girl. Thank you. you are doing a wonderful thing for the Lord. And it's a privilege to know you. Thank Thanks you. for being with us. Thank you. 
Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there, and be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.